I wonder, did Jesus ever have some days when he cranked his head back and just let out a loud bellow laugh? (laughs) Or I wonder, when Jesus was a teenager, did he go out in Nazareth on what we might call a date? Or did he go to the corner and hang out with his buddies? Uh, Did Jesus ever question his teachers? I wonder, did Jesus ever turn up his nose at some food that might have been served him for dinner? Or I wonder, did Jesus ever sneer at Joseph when he had family chores to do? Well, we don't know. We don't know all of those details about Jesus' biography, but about his anger, there is no doubt. We know that in his adult life, at least, Jesus had occasions when he got angry, sometimes in subtle ways through what we might call clenched teeth. You may remember the time when Jesus came down from the mountain, and his disciples had been out doing some work with people, and they came back and said to Jesus, you know, there are people who are healing in your name, and we are going to forbid them. And then they went on to say, would you like us to call down fire and burn them up? (laughs) That was one of those moments when Jesus, through clenched teeth, probably said, no, we're not about that in our mission. (laughs) Or you may remember the time in John's gospel when Jesus goes through painstakingly with Philip and Andrew about the nature of God and who he was, item by item. Philip then said, if you'll just show us the Father, then we'll be satisfied. (laughs) Again, through clenched teeth, Jesus must have said something like, Philip, have I been with you so long, and you still do not get it? Or you may remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, They came to arrest him. It was a very heavy moment. Peter, in his Peter kind of way, then pulled his sword from his sheath and cut off one of the soldier's ears, Malchus's ears. (laughs) Again, through probably clenched teeth, Jesus then said, put your sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Well, today's gospel text is not a clenched teeth moment. This is wide open anger. In John's version, chapter 2, Jesus goes to the temple and finds that they are working their system. What's the system? The system is money changing so that people could then buy their unblemished animals. That's putting it mildly, though. Let me tell you why he was upset. He was upset not just with some crass money changing. I think he was upset at a much deeper level with the whole system of what religion had become at the temple. You see, one of the systems was that thousands and thousands of people would come from all over the region during the Passover. And those who were from another nation or another tongue, and certainly of another religion or no religion at all, were kept in the court of the nations or the outside court where the money changers and the animals were held. That's as far into the inner circle that some of those folks ever got. They were not included, in other words, in the intimacy and the core of the religious ritual. They were kept out, literally, in the outer courtyard. Jesus seems to be irritated with the system as a whole, not just with those who were then gouging people, because that's the second part of it. The only way you could buy an unblemished animal for your Passover feast was to go to the money changers because you couldn't buy an animal in the temple without using temple money. You had to change your money then, if you were from Syria or Lebanon or somewhere else, you had to change all of your money into temple currency so that then you could buy your unblemished animal. And of course, that system then gouged people, almost like you would gouge someone outside 
of the Jaguar Stadium on a Sunday afternoon. Jesus is upset. That's putting it mildly. He had righteous anger, what we might call prophetic anger. He was upset, of course, about exclusion. He was upset about greed. He was upset about self-interest service. He was upset about the whole system, not just about individuals who might be in the outer courtyard. We're told that he was so angry he flipped their tables on them. It's a criticism that he could make about us, about today's church, whenever we get in club-like scenarios, when we take a posture of keeping some people out and allowing some people in, when we are part of a religion gouging system. In his thoughtful book, Theological Ethics, Irish theologian Kevin Hargaden talks about this condition that Jesus confronted in John chapter 2. He calls it embeddedness. Embeddedness, according to Dr. Hargaden, is the entrenchment of religion and greed and self-interest and exclusion and hypocrisy. When there's a huge gap between what we say we want to be and the way we really live, the problem with embeddedness, Dr. Hardigan says, is it makes the absolute into the relative. It's the refusal to be open to reform and renewal by being kept hostage to the status quo. That sounds strangely contemporary. Jesus flipped the tables on them. And he invites us who wear the cross on our forehead in baptism to be about table flipping ourselves whenever we see that religion has been turned into an idol or self-service ritual. I've been thinking about embeddedness since I read this over the Christmas holidays. How is it that I have some embeddedness? How, how is it that you or we, the cathedral, the Episcopal Church has embeddedness. What kind of tables would Jesus be flipping if he were among us now? I also thought about how we've also been part of table flipping ourselves. It seems we Episcopalians have been flipping some tables over the last few decades, even centuries. You may remember all the way back to the beginning of the American Episcopal Church. We flipped the first table by changing our polity. We said that lay people would have a huge role in making decisions in our church, not just bishops and priests, but the laity. We would be a democratic church, bicameral, we said. In the middle of that was then the, ordin the ordination of the first African-American to the priesthood, Absalom Jones, in 1804. Oh yes, we also began flipping tables when we began to toy with, mess with the institution of marriage, and we said, well, we know that divorce is hard on people, but we want to allow an avenue by which people can get remarried in the church. Oh yeah, and then in 1976, we flipped another table when in Minneapolis that year, we decided to ordain women. I was there at that convention. I can still remember the palpable energy of flipping that table. We flipped some other tables when we began to then elect and call those women who were ordained then to larger churches like cathedrals, where some of those same wonderful women who were ordained could then be the, de the dean of those cathedrals or the rectors of those large churches. And then, oh, by the way, we also began to flip the table when we consecrated Barbara Harris 
and others to the episcopacy. Oh yes, we didn't stop there. We began to flip some more tables in 2003 when we affirmed Gene Robinson to the episcopate, who was a partnered gay man. And then we began to pave the way for full inclusion of LGBTQ community. Seems like we've been flipping some tables over the decades. But before we get too smug about table flipping, we have to realize that sometimes the tables are flipped on us. Sometimes we're the ones who are in the outer courtyard and we're found to be excluding because of our own self-interest. We're out there changing money in some way so that we can get our own little piece of the action. Or we're working out our own style of prejudice or our own cultural narrowness. I can still remember going to a clergy conference a number of years ago when I was in the Diocese of Upper South Carolina to Gravit Center. It was out in the middle of nowhere in the middle of South Carolina. I remember driving several hours to get to Gravit Center, and I stopped at a convenience store, and I was in getting a few things for the next few days of the clergy conference, and I heard this rumbling coming up the, the highway. And into the parking lot of the convenience store then rode about 10 Harley riders. I have to admit to you today that that's been a difficult piece of our culture for me. I wonder why is it that someone is able to make that much noise. When they were riding up, I could catch myself in the middle of the counters in the convenience store thinking to myself only with my collar on might you, that, oh gosh, here comes the leather people, I said to myself. These leather people. <laughs> they came in. I could still sense myself muttering under my breath about their, their Harleys and their babes who were on their arms, their leather, their helmets, this whole culture. On the way out of the store, one of them came up to me, uh, saw my collar, and said, by the way, uh, in a very nice tone, by the way, um, can you tell me where Gravit Center is? <laughs> I said, yes, it's just a few miles up the road. I'm on my way there now. And he said, well, you know, we've been invited by your bishop to be the speaker there during the next couple days. You see, uh, we're involved in a homeless shelter uh, outside of Columbia, South Carolina, and the bishop has invited us to come and share our experiences of running the homeless shelter on behalf of the church. I felt about this big with my smugness and my prejudice, my money-changing attitude of automatically categorizing this group of people who were then coming to speak to us, the table was flipped onto me. Jesus begins to establish in John's gospel, early in the gospel, the new kingdom order. And part of the new kingdom order is the difficult enterprise of table flipping. It's a prophetic part of the gospel, to be sure. It's not always easy. This coming to terms with the status quo of finding new ways of loving God and loving neighbor, of being merciful and just in our society, of exercising inclusion and a wide-open generosity as the church. Of course, what we know is that in the table flipping, then comes the table welcoming. In flipping tables, we also have a juxtaposition of opening up new welcome and hospitality. Table flipping turns into table welcoming. I want you to imagine, here's the altar, if the camera could pick that up. 
Here's the altar of St. John's Cathedral, beautiful altar. I want you to imagine that this is the near end of a long altar that goes all the way back through the walls of the cathedral and goes all the way out into eternity. I want you to imagine that that's God's table. And that table is the near end of an extended, long, never-ending table that goes off into the history of the world and on into the future. You and I would then find ourselves honored and privileged that we get to gather at this table, to gather with all the saints and heroes and heroines that must be seated at that table all the way back. But what you, can I, you and I can also imagine is that there's going to be some people at that table that we don't expect. That cousin of ours, or that enemy of mine, or that group of people that always seem to be, you know, like the leather people who came riding up with their Harleys, or other kinds of people we can imagine, could they be at that table, this table flipping that turns into table welcoming? As you and I are imagining this table and who would be seated there, we might remember that Jesus on Good Friday hung between two thieves. They were some of the worst reprobates in their culture and society. Remembering that conversation that happened there on Calvary, that one thief looking towards Jesus of Nazareth and saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus then looking back at him, yes, he says, today, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen.